Um, hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Alice Harper. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Southampton. And I'm also one of the 2017 um, Software Sustainability Institute fellows like Nicoletta. Um, and I'd like to talk about testing scientific codes. Um, so I'm going to go over why first we should actually bother with testing. I mean, if we're trying to publish results of our amazing science, why should we bother writing tests when they're quite time consuming? Um, and I'm going to go over what we should actually test when we write our tests. And finally go about um, how we should actually go about writing these tests. Um, Okay, so first, why should we test? Um, so I have a, so I'm an astrophysicist, hence the stars at the start. Um, so I have a physics degree. Um, and in my physics degree, we had lots of courses on experimental methods. So I was really taught how to write, you know, how to make proper experiments and have rigorous testing. Um, and experimental science, you don't trust results unless um, you've really demonstrated you've followed the scientific method. Um, so you've shown to the best of your ability that your results are accurate, that they are reproducible, and that they are reliable. Um, and if you don't have this, no one is going to publish your amazing results. Uh, no one's going to trust it, hopefully. Though maybe not after the keynote we heard earlier. That, that always happens. Um, but in theory, that's what happens in experimental science. Um, in computational science, um, it amazed me. So I'm quite new to the field. And when I arrived and started reading papers, it amazed me that people don't do this. Um, when really, it seems to me, if you're doing computational science, your computer is your apparatus, and you're performing experiments. Um, so really, we should also be following the scientific method, and we really shouldn't trust anyone's results if they don't have proper testing in their codes, because um, that's just it's not good science. Um, OK, so what should we test? Um, so again, taking inspiration from experimental science, um, we should be testing our apparatus and our method. Um, so here our apparatus and our method are the software that we write. Um, so we need to demonstrate that this works as we intended. So if we say that our software does something, we need to demonstrate to the best of our ability it does what we say it does. Um, we also need to understand limitations. So in experimental science, you'll measure things like systematic errors. You'll measure whether there's any noise in your detector, maybe. Um, so we should be looking to see if we have numerical error, um, so if you're doing floating point computations, if you're adding 1 to one to, uh, to 10 to the 30, then it's not going to be necessarily what you expect it to be. And we should really understand this. Um, also, we need to um, understand that if we use an algorithm, it will have a certain accuracy. And we need to really quantify and understand this when we publish our results. Um, finally, we need to make sure our results are reproducible. Um, so if you publish something, it's no use if you're the only one that can run your code. Um, maybe in 10 years' time, someone will come along, read your paper, be like, this is amazing. I want to use this code. I want to build on it and do, extend it. But if you haven't made your code public, if you've made it impossible to understand, if you have no testing, so I have no idea whether your code is correct or not, then that's really not reproducible, and it really harms scientific progress. Um, certainly in my field, it's ridiculously prevalent for people not to actually publish their code or not have any installation instructions. Um, so it's quite difficult. Um, OK, but it's hard. Um, so by its very nature, when we're writing scientific code, it's probably because we can't actually solve the system by hand. Um, so we've got complex equations. Maybe we've got very large data sets. We can't actually do these um, calculations by hand. Um, the codes themselves are often developed over very long time periods, so potentially over decades, and they have lots and lots of collaborators. So maybe the code was first written by a PhD student in the 90s, that person's now left the field, but they've written a really important module, um, but no documentation or testing. But no one wants to touch it because that's the core part of the code. Um, so that can be quite difficult to deal with. Um, they also, by their very nature, investigate unknowns. Um, so. For normal conventional codes, we might expect what the output is. So we can test, this is my expected output. Does my code match this? Um, with science, we might not know what the output is going to look like. So how do we create de uh, test data in the first place? Um, however, this doesn't mean we should give up. That is unacceptable. Um, OK, so how do we actually write these tests? Um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to break down our software and start writing unit tests. So for every function or every small group of functions, we write a little test for it. Um, and this is because we can't really trust that the whole code works unless the actual individual parts work. 
I mean, I certainly have written code where I've um, tested it, I've found that it reproduces the results that I th think it should do. But then when I actually do unit tests, it's actually not doing at all what I expect. Um, so this is actually really important. Um, it also makes it easier to test complex code. So if you've got hundreds and hundreds of functions, it can be really daunting to start writing tests. Um, but if you start with function by function, testing them, it makes it a lot easier. Um, you need to make sure that when you write these tests that they actually cover the entire parameter space. Um, so if you say that your code should work for a certain domain, you need to check the edge cases. So the, um, the cases at like the beginning and end of your domain. Because this is quite often where you get special cases and where your code is likely to break. Um, and yeah, you also need to check that your code will break when you expect it to. Because if you pass in complete gibberish to your function, it should break. It shouldn't just be like, yeah, that's fine. I'm going to process that. And then maybe you submit it to a supercomputer, wait weeks for it to run, and it comes back and it turns out your input data was wrong, but your code had no testing. So it didn't break, it just ran. Um, so a little example. Um, OK, so here we've got a really stupid function to calculate the square of an integer. So essentially, I'm going to take a number and add it to itself that many times. Um, and I'm going to use unit test to uh, run some tests on this. So I'm going to check that the square of 4 is 16. So that's like a normal case. I've then got a more extreme case. So I've got a larger number. Check that that's right. And I'm also going to check that it raises an error. So if I pass in a string, it should raise a type error. Um, so if I run this, then hooray, it has given me nothing out, which means it's worked. Um, OK, so that's OK. But this really relies on the fact that I have thought about what test data I should do quite carefully. Um, if I want to be a bit more rigorous about this, I can use a library like Hypothesis. So Hypothesis um, is really good for testing the entire parameter space, so for catching those edge cases I mentioned. Um, so here, I've kind of got a quite similar structure to what I had before, um, but I've got these given things. So I'm going to test that my code works for all the integers between minus a million and plus a million. And again, I'm going to test that it, if I pass in a string, it breaks. So if I try running this, then I get an error I get. It tells me my code doesn't work for minus 1. Um, if I look back at my actual function, then this is kind of, you can see where this came from. I had this whole range thing here. And you have range of minus 1. It's not actually going to enter that loop. So I need some like maybe absolute statements here or a special case for dealing with minus numbers. Um, so yeah, hypothesis is really good for catching edge cases in unit tests. Um, and I wish I'd heard about it earlier. Um, OK, so next step. So you've checked that the individual parts work. You now need to check that they actually work together. Um, so this can get a lot more complicated here because you're building up the complexity. Um, and so it can get a lot more difficult. Um, but this is a really important step um, to do. OK, and then the third step is you need to monitor the development of your code with regression tests. So if you're continuously developing a code, um, you need to make sure that it's actually improving in performance, um, or at least not getting worse. Um, so this can actually catch some really subtle bugs. So maybe if you, um, you change your code a bit and it kind of makes an error that doesn't cause it to break, but just causes everything to kind of shift a bit and be a bit less good, then it can catch those sorts of errors. Um, it's also really good if you have other people using your code, because um, it can help enforce backwards compatibility. Um, so for example, if you change a function so it now has three arguments rather than two arguments, um, then this will catch that. Um, and it means that if lots of people are using your code, suddenly everything won't break for them. So that's quite good. Um, OK, so I mentioned scientific codes are particularly hard to test. Um, so what are some kind of more science-specific issues we might have? Um, so I mentioned we have unknown behavior. Um, so in experimental science, um, it's quite common that if you have an apparatus, you'll do tests with controls. Um, so say you've got a detector, you'll check that if you have nothing there, then it won't detect anything. Um, so we can do a similar thing in computational science. Um, so here, I'm just going to use the trapezium rule um, to approximate an integral. So this is where you have a curve, you do a load of trapezium underneath, and you add up their areas. Um, and I'm going to test it on a really simple function. So y equals s, uh, y equals x even. Um, and if I integrate that between 0 and 1, I should hopefully get the area of the triangle underneath, so 0 0.5. 
Um, so if I run that, hooray, it works. Um, so if I change the number, then it should hopefully work for something else. Hooray, it works. So that's so we can do so this is a really simple example, but this is actually a really good thing that I use a lot in my code. So I do kind of time evolution simulations. Um, and I it's quite common that you will have some kind of static initial data that shouldn't change with time if I um, evolve my code. Um, and this can catch some really good errors. So if you're doing any like sort of simulations, this these are really, I have found, particularly useful. Um, so you often have random stuff to deal with. Um, so if you're measuring data in, you'll get randomness. You might have randomness just from floating point errors. Um, and this makes your code particularly hard to test because you have no, um, your, yeah, your output's always going to change, and that's not necessarily a wrong thing. Um, so ways that we can get around this is we can isolate the random parts, so use unit tests to check that everything else works. Um, also, we can test averages. We can check limits. Um, in physics, you often have physical quantities, so you'll have things like energy will be conserved, momentum will be conserved, and these are all things that we can test. Um, so if you go to another example, I'm going to generate a load of random data here. So these are just a load of random numbers, and I'm going to run some function on it. So I'm going to square the number and times it by its sign. If I run it again, different answer, maybe you can't see, but this is changing every time. Um, so let's do some tests of this. Um, so I know that my input's between 0 and 1, so my output must be between 0 and 0 0.841. I can also calculate the average and check that that's correct. So I know that the average of this function must be the integral of it over its domain, um, so that's 0 0.223. So if I run this test, then hooray, my function has the correct limit, so it's between 0 and 0 0.841, and it's got the correct average. Um, OK. So um, yeah, so if you're doing simulations, you're often taking something where you've got a continuous domain, and you're cutting it up. You're discretizing your domain um, and calculating the solution at individual points. Um, and this will um, cause errors to appear. Um, and in theory, if you make your resolutions, or if you cut up your domain into finer and finer pieces, you're approaching a continuous uh, solution, and so the accuracy of your solution should improve. And the order at which this improves, so how quickly it improves, should be, in theory, the same order as the algorithm you've used. Um, so if you use an algorithm which um, should converge at order resolution size, then it should converge around the same resolution. Um, and if it doesn't, that means you've probably got some kind of systematic error or like you haven't implemented the algorithm correctly. Um, so again, this means that you won't get an answer that's wrong. It's just not as accurate as you may think it will be. Um, so we can do tests for this. Um, so here I've got an array where I've got a load of different resolutions. Um, and again, I'm going to use the trapezium rule to calculate this. And I'm going to calculate it for a, a load of different resolutions. Um, so I've got different numbers of trapezia that I'm using to sum up and find the integral. So if I run this, then I get my array. And then if I try plotting the errors in a log-log plot, then these points here are my errors. This is my resolution. Um, and here I've plotted h squared, so the square of the resolution, because I know that the trapezium rule is order h squared accurate. And you can see here quite clearly that these are the same slope. So this means that my order of convergence of my code is the same as the algorithm. So this really points that I've implemented the algorithm correctly. Um, OK, and the last point here is that for numerical error, um, because we're always going to have floating point errors, you can't necessarily check equality. It's better to check that it's close. Um, so if you look at um, here, so here I didn't check equality. I didn't check that my average was exactly equal. I checked that it was close within a certain tolerance. Um, so this is really useful for testing the scientific codes. Um, OK, so to conclude, um, when we're writing scientific codes, we also need to follow the scientific method, because this is how science works. Um, we can't just say that we're special because we're computational scientists and computers are perfectly good at calculating everything. We need to also be very careful and very rigorous um, if we want to be able to trust our results. Um, similarly, we should only really trust results from others that have proper testing. 
it's, I don't think it's acceptable for journals to um, publish papers where the code isn't tested at all. They've just been like, hey, there's this result that I know the answer to, my code can do that. Doesn't mean that if you then run it on this complicated system that that's also going to be correct. Um, okay, so to finish, um, if you want to read anything else about this, I recommend going onto the Software Sustainability Institute website because um, they've got a load of information here and they're really pushing um, lots of these sorts of concepts. Um, so thank you for listening. Anybody have questions? Yeah, two comments. One, uh, you gave us a number of reasons why scientific code is special and has special requirements for testing. Uh, for a complementary answer to that question, I would recommend an article by Konrad Hinsen, published a few years ago, who argued that the point that makes scientific code so special is floating point. Yeah. computations as compared to most other um, computer applications in, in the real world outside. And um, second comment from our own experience, a project of moderate, of, of middle size, say uh, 10 men years so far, um, uh, we uh, gave to students who came in our group for two, three months, uh, the task, write us some tests, uh, because we thought that's an easy way to get into the project and to do something productive. And experience is rather that the tests that come out that way are too trivial. They are testing things like, indeed, uh, two times two yields four. And uh, you have really to have a deep understanding of uh, what the software does uh, to write meaningful tests. Yeah, that's entirely the problem, I think, because the codes are so complex, um, it can be really difficult to even think of all the different things that could possibly go wrong um, and really think about the testing and how best to test it. Um, but I think certainly starting with unit tests, because I now, whenever I read um, papers about code, I always go to the, try and find the code itself if it's actually published um, and actually look at the testing. And I very actually rarely see unit tests. So I think even just starting with that would be a great first step, certainly in my field. Are there any more questions? Um, do you have some experience with testing optimization problems? This is something I'm concerned with. No, I'm afraid I do um, hydrodynamic simulations, so I don't have much, any experience in that. Or, or anything where you do have a large amount of setup to do your simulations? Uh, so, I mean, unit tests are very nice if you do have um, small functions that you are aware of that have a deep deterministic input and output, um, but as soon as it grows larger, the overhead for setting up one test grows as well. Do you have some experience with that? Yeah, so um, I do do some, like, most of my work at the moment is with large HPC codes, um, and for that you have, to, like, even to set up the code, it takes, like, 20 minutes even to compile it. Um, so for that, I find the most useful kind of tests are the things like controls, so testing my simulation, um, for like simple data will produce the correct answer. Um, so yeah, again, it's just, it's really hard to think about the proper testing and the ways to approach it. But I think thinking from a more scientific point of view and taking inspiration from experimental science, definitely I found has helped improve my tests so much. Just uh, one final comment first. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. We also work on a project and have been struggling with testing, well, multiple times. Uh, but what we observed is that 
thinking of tests is also deepening your understanding of the things you work with. So you're nodding, so you also had the same experience, right? Okay, yeah, that's something also we came up with that we actually understand how it works. Yeah, okay. I I see in your face that you had the same experience. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I write, wrote a uh, code um, like at the beginning of the year, and I thought it was it was it seemed to be working perfectly. And then I started writing a few more unit tests and found that it was actually it just wasn't doing at all what I thought it was. And by actually really writing and thinking more carefully about what I was testing, I really was able to probe the actual behavior of it. So uh, thank you for the talk. Actually, one comment. I think the biggest problem with testing scientific software is basically nobody pays you for refactoring your code, yes? So everybody's totally, um, yeah, you know, everybody's, um, everybody enjoys new functionality or new features, but basically nobody pays you for making code better. And the problem that I've observed is uh, you start with small functions, you start with unit tests, and then your program grows. But unfortunately, you don't have time to break it down in a reasonable matter, manner. And then, basically, you cannot unit test it because it's not a unit anymore. Um, so I think that's one another uh, difficulty in scientific software. Yeah, so actually, um, a slide I have that I didn't quite have time for. Um, so it was a bit um, talking about continuous integration and co-coverage. Um, so continuous integration is where you have um, it's kind of tools that you can use that continually run tests for you. Um, so you don't have to worry about doing it yourself and you can always make sure that any changes you make to your code will automatically, it will detect bugs for you. Um, but the thing that I find really useful is co-coverage measures. So checking that your tests actually cover all your code because it's very easy to write tests that maybe only hit the nice cases, but then you need to check that it can, um, it can also detect the, like the, the more subtle cases and more like any dis like if you have lots of if branches and stuff, that it's actually hitting and testing all of them. So I find co-coverage is a very useful measure to deal with things like that. Okay, I think we have time for only one question, so... <laughs> okay, I'll go first. So if you could uh, keep it short, it would be nice. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, relating to the previous comment, uh, I found that the language choice also makes some difference in code quality and the ease of testing. And just as you said, you might have if branches that never get evaluated until they do and then they break. So that's one of my main sort of concerns, especially with Python, since it's an interpreted language. How would you feel? Do you, do you know of any static analysis tools for Python that would be sort of covered by compilers in other languages with static typing and other sort of safety features? Uh, short answer, no. Um, I mean, I do use this code coverage tool, um, so CoCov with my Python code. Um, but yeah, sadly, I don't know of any off the top of my head. Like Sorry. Placate, okay. Okay, thanks. Well, uh, I think that concludes this talk, so thank you very much.